Hello, and welcome back to my channel. So today I want to tell you about how dynamic mode decomposition puts restrictions on your dynamics. And you can't just use any old dynamics if you're doing a DMD routine, and it all depends on the choice of vector spaces that you're operating over. So tune in and yeah, let's talk about it. So dynamic mode decomposition, I mean, it's been purported to be able to solve pretty much anything. So what I want to tell you is that once you select the vector space that you're working over, the collection of Koopman operators or Liouville operators become extremely restricted based on the vector space that you're operating over. So if you choose a space of analytic functions, and so this is something like the exponential dot product space or the Gaussian RBF space, or if you do extended DMD and you use features that end up giving you an analytic kernel at the end of the day, then in all of these cases, you end up finding that, that the only dynamics that will end up working for the Kuhlman operator to make it densely defined or bounded, which is what you need in order to do any sort of work with it, is it makes those dynamics analytic. So I'm going to show you how that ends up happening. And I want to walk you through this step by step because it involves a bit of analysis. So why don't we go ahead and start talking about it? <sighs> okay, so we're going to start here by talking about uh, the property of kernel functions. And now kernel functions, these are the central object in sampling theory. This goes back to Shannon's work on what is now called the shannon Nyquist sampling theorem, where Hardy actually put that on solid footing by using the paley wiener reproduced kernel Hilbert space. Now critical to this idea is that we're going to be working with densely defined operators. So we need to show that the domain itself has various properties that will allow us to get good characterizations out of our dynamics. And so the first thing that we really want to talk about is the fact that kernel functions span their space. So if you take a collection of all kernel functions that correspond to the various centers and you take their span, then that is always going to be dense inside of the Hilbert space. So if you take the closure of the span, then you get the Hilbert space back. And this could be proven really simply. In one case, if you actually build your Hilbert space out of your kernels, and it's pretty obvious. Uh, this is the ehrenschein mohr theorem or the ehrenschein mohr construction, which is more or less the GNS construction, but that's another topic. So in this case, basically what we can see is that if we take the span of the kernels and, and suppose that they're not dense in the Hilbert space, then that means that there is going to be at least a one dimensional space perpendicular to the span of the kernels. So if you take a G in that perpendicular space and you take its inner product against any of the kernel functions, then that should be zero. That's the definition of a perp space. But of course, the inner product of G against a kernel function is just G evaluated at the center of that kernel function. So that means that G evaluated at that center is zero. But we have every single point in our domain as a center of our kernel functions. And so that means that G has to be identically zero. This means that if you take the span of the kernels, then if you take their closure, that has to end up being the Hilbert space. So we're gonna use this idea in order to get properties of our domains of our densely defined operators. So if we take a densely defined operator and we take its domain, so what we can show is that for any point in the domain of the functions, our x, if we select an x out of there, a little x, then what ends up happening is that there has to be some function in our domain that doesn't vanish there. Because otherwise, that means that our domain is going to be perpendicular to the kernel at that point. And so that means that the domain itself can't be dense. And so that's a really, really important property. And so I'm going to go ahead and use this property in order to get a characterization of multiplication operators or symbols of multiplication operators. So the spaces that we're going to be working over are going to be 
the exponential top rod kernel and the Gaussian RBF kernel. And generally speaking, we are going to be using kernels that correspond to spaces of real analytic functions. So what we're going to show is that the symbol of the multiplication operator, RF, ends up being real analytic as well. Okay, so starting off with multiplication operators because this is a little bit simpler. If we take a multiplication operator with symbol F, that basically means that we're going to be taking some G out of our Hilbert space, or our domain of our operator, and we're going to be hitting it with F by multiplication. So it's just G times F. And if G is in the domain of this operator, then that means that G times F has to be back in the Hilbert space. And then that means that G times F is equal to some H, where H is real analytic. So on one side, we have G is real analytic, we don't know what F is, and we have that H is real analytic. And real analytic means that if you take any point in your domain, then you can represent your function in a neighborhood of that point as an analytic series. And so what this is gonna end up giving us is that if I take a point X and I wanna show that F is real analytic there, then generally speaking, I'm just going to write f of x is equal to h over g of x, or h of x over g of x. And in this case, we would be done, right? Uh, because if you take the quotient of two power series, you get another power series, which you can obtain through long division, and you're good. But of course, there is one little caveat, and we need that g of x has to be non-zero because you can't divide by zero. And so that's where that previous discussion ends up coming in. Basically, that means we know that for any fixed x, that there is going to be some g that is non-vanishing at that x, and that g is a real analytic function. So then at that particular point, we take f of x is equal to h of x over g of x, and we know that g of x is non-vanishing at x. And so therefore, we have f as a ratio of two real analytic functions where the denominator is non-vanishing at the center point, which means that f can be expressed as a real analytic function, as a power series, in the neighborhood of x. And there you go. So we have just characterized the symbols for densely defined multiplication operators, and we've characterized them as real analytic functions over the domain x. So now we would like to show this for Lyapunov operators as well. And this is going to be a little bit more complicated because we're dropping down into our derivatives. But the argument itself really isn't all that different. You just have to make sure that the things that you want actually work. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Now let's take a look at the Lyapunov operator. So a Lyapunov operator with symbol f is written as the gradient of g of x times f of x, where when I write times as really a row vector times a column vector, where f of x is the dynamics for some sort of dynamical system. And g, of course, is being taken from the domain of our label operator, which we're assuming to be dense. So what ended up happening last time is that we were talking about the g inner product against k of x. And so what we were doing is we were leveraging the idea that g mapping to g of x is a bounded linear functional, and that means that there is some function inside of our Hilbert space by the Reese representation theorem that represents function evaluation. And so then we said that if all of our g's were zero at a point, then there is some function in our Hilbert space that is gonna be orthogonal to that set. So here, things are a little bit different. Uh, what we're going to be working with is we are working with a gradient, which is a sum of partial derivatives, and each of these partial derivatives are being multiplied by one of the coefficients of f. And so in this setting, we have, say, the gradient of g of x times v for some v in Rn, and that is going to be our linear functional. And so we're looking at the linear functional g maps to gradient of g of x times v. And it turns out that if you take a look at the partial derivative of g and you evaluate it at a point x and you multiply it by some number, then Steinmort and Crispin's book 
there is a theorem in there that says that this is a bounded linear functional, provided that your kernel function is differentiable or continuously differentiable. So since we have real analytic functions, continuous differentiability is good, check. And so we can move forward. So in this case, we have the bounded linear functional G mapping to the partial derivative with respect to say X1 and evaluating that partial derivative at X and then we multiply it by some V1. And then if you take a finite linear combination of these guys, and so you add all the way up to the partial derivative with respect to Xn of G of X times Vn, then we have that this combination is the gradient of G of X times our vector V, and this is a bounded linear functional. That means that there exists some function, we'll say H of X comma V or something like that. And this function represents our bounded linear functional. Using this idea, what we can show is that for any fixed X, if we take a look at the set W of X, and we set that equal to the span of all the gradients of G of X, where G is inside of our dense domain of our operator and X stays fixed, this span should be equal to all of Rn. And if it is not, then that means that there has to be some fixed vector V in Rn, such that the gradient of G of X against V has to be equal to zero for all G inside of our dense domain. And hence, that means that for the corresponding vector in our Hilbert space, H sub X comma V, then that means that all of those G's have to be orthogonal to that function, which means that our domain is not actually dense. So now what this W sub X allows us to do is that given any sort of X naught in Rn, we can go ahead and select a collection of G's out of our domain, say G1 through Gn, such that the gradient of G1, the gradient of G2, the gradient of G3, the gradient of G4, all the way up to the gradient of Gn are all linearly independent. And this means that if we take a matrix that we make by putting each one of these gradients in a row, and we take the determinant of that matrix, then that determinant is going to be non-zero at the point x naught. And if you remember your definition of determinants, that determinants are a sum of products of their entries, you will see immediately that the determinant of a matrix of analytic functions is itself analytic. And since it is non-zero x naught, that means it's going to be non-zero in a neighborhood of x naught. If we take a look at the image of each one of these GIs underneath the Leaville operator, then what we can do is we can label these as, say, big G1 all the way down through big Gn. And each of these is a real analytic function. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to isolate each one of the components of f, so f1 all the way down to fn. And for each gi, we get big gi by taking a look at the gradient of little gi at x times f of x. And so that means that we're looking at each of the partial derivatives of gi times the respective component of f. With all the g1s through gn's, what we ultimately end up having is we have a system of equations where our coefficients are the analytic functions that come from the partial derivatives of gi, and the unknowns are the components of f. So what we can do is we can actually appeal to Kramer's rule. Kramer's rule says that if we make a matrix out of these gradients and we take, say, the ith column and replace that ith column with each of these entries of big G, so big G1 down through big Gn, and we take the determinant of that matrix and then we divide by the determinant of the original matrix that we just talked about, then that should get us f1 of x, or fi of x. And we know that that bottom determinant is a real analytic function, and it is non-vanishing at x0. And so that means that this quotient is a real analytic function. And so f sub i is a real analytic function in a neighborhood of x0, but then that x0 was chosen arbitrarily. So f sub i is a real analytic function over all of Rn.
So there you go. That is the real analyticity of a function f. That is a vector valued function being used as the symbol for a Lieville operator that is densely defined over these two spaces, the exponential dot product kernel space or the Gaussian RBF space, or really any space of real analytic functions, which is going to be most of the spaces uh, that you're going to work with that give nice results. So thank you for listening. And next time, I want to talk to you about how we can get some convergence results in norm for the Liouville operator and over these kernel spaces. And this is a dramatic improvement in, say, the convergence results in the field in general. There's going to be two or three different approaches that we'll have for these norm convergence routines. So I encourage you to stick around and subscribe. And yeah, with that, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.